Okay, we are live with Tomer and Tomer. I don't want to butcher your last name, but I want to try it. Tomer Strolight. That's it. Easy. It's Tomer Strolight. The background of that last name? I don't know. I think it's Polish or German or you're somewhere from Europe. I think it's Polish. Got it. Because my uh, parents were from Israel. I was born in Israel, came here when I was just five years old. And I think their parents all fled from Eastern Europe uh, just around World War II. And then why, 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 do you remember why your parents came from Israel to Canada? I think my understanding is my dad was concerned that there was just going to be endless warfare over there. Um, like my first memory as a child is being carried into a bomb shelter when an air raid siren was going off. I think it was during the Yom Kippur War in 1973. It might have been something else, but I, I didn't really know what was going on and just those times coincide. So um, they were concerned and they wanted to flee to a better place where there is a better dream and they managed to get... Uh, immigration status into Canada. Wow. Yeah. I remember my, my father had to, he was born in what was then he was Croatian, but the country was called Yugoslavia. And he kind of got out through some mountainous area through Austria, declared refugee status. And they basically said, listen, we're sending you back. We don't want you. <laughs> you can either go to, apparently the church is going to pay for a boat ticket for Canada or Australia. You have to pick now you're leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he, he thought Canada was closer if he ever wanted to come back and see his parents. So wow. he went to Canada through the northern part of Germany, he got out on a boat and then kind of landed here. And he, I remember him saying when he got here, he couldn't speak English. The food was different. He wanted to go home, but he had no money to get back home. Then he met our mom who was here from Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, trying to make a better life for their family. And they came here and Nick and I were, were born. So I'm like, wow, Canada, we're pretty grateful for this country because if it didn't attract these people, Nick and my brother and I, who started this business wouldn't even exist. Wouldn't we wouldn't, wouldn't be. But anyway, I'm really interested in your story because you write kind of like the most beautiful little essays on Bitcoin and altogether they cover a lot of topics. What, how did you get to this point? Tomer, like, how do you get to the point where you're writing this? Like, what was your career before Bitcoin? And how do you get to the point where you're writing all this stuff about Bitcoin? Well, I wasn't a writer. I was a businessman for 20 years. I had two business degrees that I got, you know, in, in my university age. And at the time that I graduated from university, the internet was just ha starting to happen. Like the original browser Netscape hadn't even been released yet. And multimedia was the hot thing interactive computing right? people hadn't used the internet or for the few people who had it was only dial up or something at a university which was also really slow in those days um and and i was interested in technology and so i wanted to get a career doing something new i started working for a startup at the time startups weren't quite a big thing yet we were going to do a magazine on a cd-rom and then the internet came Netscape oh my gosh, I think I remember those ideas of magazines on CD-ROMs. Yeah, they were. You, I think a few days. people did them. You, yeah, you would get the yeah. CD and you would kind of select yeah. different stuff and beautiful graphics would pop up on yeah. your screen. And it was, you know, but it was like as hard as it is to use Bitcoin now, it was just as hard to get a CD-ROM <laughs> to work on your computer. You had, to, you had to install a card and a driver and you had to flip an interrupt switch and lots of things could go wrong. And then, of course, it got so good that it was mindless and then it got obsolete and nobody's got CD-ROMs anymore on their computers or even DVD drives because everyone just streams. So that's how many, that's how old I am in terms of technological generations. Um, I, I remember the pre-internet um, computing world. But I, so I ended up with a very long career in new media. I worked, I went to work for the Toronto Star after that startup uh, thing. I helped them launch their website. Like I was there the night that the website was launched. I was in charge of a number of things. And I, and I had a career there at that company and its parent company for like 16 years. I ended up running the digital media division. I did a lot of mergers and acquisitions and comp and startups of new ventures and partnerships. Uh, and then I left and I did some private equity stuff, uh, which saw me returning back to many of those um, companies in the portfolio, helping helping sell them off. Um, and I, and then I did a couple of other things. So that's like 20 years of career, uh, but like MBA type person, businessman actually wore a suit for a number of years and a tie even in the early part oh, of my career. Um, so, that's rough. That's rough. Yeah, you were really like sacrificing. I, I you were really sacrificing. <laughs> it was just, it was, you know, like this was the world 
of being a professional sure. yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. those days. You drove into the office and you sat in meetings and if you were an executive or an aspiring one, you wore a suit. Um, and uh, and so I, I, I had like some really wonderful experiences in, in business, la launching businesses in particular, and especially when they succeeded, but also you learn a lot from failures and I, I had my share of failures. And, uh, and it was all really fascinating. And then I, I was running a much smaller company in and at, my introduction to Bitcoin happened in 2013. I didn't do anything professionally in it, but I was it was one of the I was one of those people who fell in love with Bitcoin and was tumbling down the rabbit hole and just became obsessed with it. And everyone was like, oh, my God, this guy's lost his mind. All he talks about is Bitcoin <laughs> and we're trying to do work here. So I had. I, and I wanted to find a job in Bitcoin because I was so fascinated by it. It felt like the internet did back in 1996. But I was very critical of um, all of the altcoins. They, they all seemed like scams and frauds to me. I still very much hold that opinion. And most of the jobs that were in the space were promoting and starting and selling these things that were dishonest in my view. So for years, I wasn't really able to find any anything in Bitcoin. So I was doing other jobs in business, fiat mining as Bitcoiners like to call it. And um, and then COVID hit and the company that I was running, which was a small training company that did keynotes and classroom uh, education about the science of emotional intelligence, uh, get, got hit really hard when COVID hit because everybody of course canceled all their classroom events and all their all their company meetups for uh, for keynotes. Uh, so I had to downsize the company and I downsized myself out of it amongst other people because the founders were still there. I thought it would be easier to find another job. I was just kind of looking and looking and looking. And, you know, it, it was April of 2022 when I uh, t terminated myself. And in September, I still hadn't found anything. And it was so April of 2020, 20, you said 2022. Yeah, sorry, April of 2020. 2020 sorry, 2020. Yeah. That yeah. I, that, I downsized the business and um, it, by September of 2020, I still hadn't found anything. And it was, I mean, I, I'd never had to look for almost any length of time in my career for a job. It was, there was high demand for what I did, but, but here I was, I just, uh, you know, the whole situation was bizarre because everybody was locked down and people really weren't hiring. And, um, and in September, or it was, it was actually, it wasn't until February of 2021 that I said, well, you know what? I, I love Bitcoin. I can't find a job in anything. I have a lot of ideas about Bitcoin. I was really getting involved in it again because there was nothing else to do. So I would spend my days going for walks in the forest, listening to podcasts about Bitcoin, um, starting to tweet about it, just trying to do various things. And I said, you know what? I've got a lot of things that I want to say about Bitcoin. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start writing. And I told my wife, that's what I'm going to do. And she was okay with that. It wasn't going to cost anything, I suppose. And I, I wasn't really finding a job anyways. And so I, I decided to start writing about Bitcoin and I wanted to say some, something original. And this is to your question. Um, I saw that there were a lot of really long form pieces about Bitcoin. There were people writing really long thoughtful essays and then there was a bunch of tweets and there was a bunch of podcasts but everything was like it was either very very like tweets weren't really educational and the podcasts or the long essays required a tremendous amount of effort and they required that you learn like a whole lot of things at once and they were very um they were very academic in in many ways uh because they were like explaining austrian economics and libertarianism and all these political things that most people aren't interested in and so I just wanted to share in part when I started writing just like how Bitcoin works everyone's so confused why does it why is it this way why does it even exist what's it what does it mean that it's decentralized what does it mean that it's permissionless what does it mean that it's censorship resistant like these are terms that nobody has ever heard before so I I, I kind of set out to do that I said I was going to write a bunch of short essays I don't know where it came to me that I would write um, that the gimmick would be, I was going to make all of them like only three minutes in length. They would all have the word why in Bitcoin in it so that it would demonstrate that they were explanatory. Um, they would be suitable for beginners. But I'd been in the space for eight years and I thought I had some original ideas. So I wanted them all to also be impressive to long time Bitcoiners so that someone who like has been running a podcast for years would listen to it and say, 
you know what? I never looked at Bitcoin from that particular angle before. That's really interesting. That's a fresh take. And so that was uh, that was what I set out to do. I started writing these essays. I, I solicited some feedback from people who were actively interested learners. I joined a couple of Telegram groups that uh, other content producers were running as part of their Patreon support. So like Gigi's and Robert Breedloves. And, uh, and I announced my intention to write these pieces in there. And people gave me a bunch of ideas of what they thought it, I, I should write about. And I, I kind of ingested all of that. And then ended up starting to write my Why Bitcoin series is how I started writing. And again, nobody was paying me. Nobody was asking me to write that. I just thought I should write these pieces. And, and I aggressively shared them like in these Telegram groups and on Twitter, even though I had a very small following. And, you know, after I wrote three or four of them, Robert Breedlove shared one of them. And then uh, Peter McCormack saw one of them and really liked it and invited me on the show a month later. And uh, Gigi saw some of them and shared them. And I was really pestering people. And so some other people eventually read them and they said, oh, these are really good essays. And then um, and then once the momentum started to get going for them, uh, Corey Clipston at Swan Bitcoin reached out to me and said, hey, let's turn these into an ebook." And then one thing kind of led to another and I, I became more confident and experienced as a writer. I completed that series. I started writing other things and I started getting invitations to appear on podcasts and, and one thing led to another. And now I'm full time in Bitcoin, not because I applied for a job, but because I just surrendered myself into Bitcoin and things started to work out for me. I love that story. I, it's interesting that you use the word surrendered yourself. Have you always thought that way? Like, have you always thought that your life would just kind of take a path that if you let it happen, things would happen properly for you? Have Not you always. always thought that way? Or was that a way of thinking? Because most people won't use that language. Yeah. Where does that think, come from? I think that the best parts of my life were always in situations when I just went with the flow. Um, you know, where I, where I kind of had a, in my heart, I knew what I wanted to do and I went and did it. I like when I was graduating from business school, I knew I didn't want to work for the big companies that were hiring. I, you know, I'd had a few interviews with them and there was just like the chemistry didn't feel right. And they <laughs> yes. weren't, I don't think they were going to offer me a job anyways, but there was just some, uh, I just, you know, I, I was doing a finance degree initially and I was really good at the math and everything, but I didn't like the culture of yeah basically. i could relate yeah right yeah. It, was, it wasn't for me and then i so i stayed on and did a master's degree and majored in marketing and i didn't like what i saw in the marketing realm either so i was kind of like you know i want to do i, I like comp i was really liking working with computers and laying stuff out and this internet thing was interesting and so i i found this startup and i was like i had two business degrees and i was working for minimum wage but i was happy and, uh, and so that was an example of kind of surrendering myself and things, things went a little sideways there, but I saw this job ad at the Toronto star and I got hired. I was a little nervous about going to work for a big company, but there were good people there who I, who I was working for and they were supportive of being creative and being entrepreneurial, like creating businesses within businesses. And it, and it worked out really well for, until it stopped working out. So it really has been important for me to follow my heart throughout my career. And any time when I wasn't really following my heart, um, like living in fear, doing something, doing something or not doing something because I was worried it would affect my income or my prestige, things got pretty bad pretty quickly for me. Um, but it's hard, you know, the older you get, in a sense, the less you dream or the more you feel like your decisions, have been, your, your past decisions have paved the way for your future course. Like I thought I needed to be, I, I was a CEO of a company for, you know, and the chairman of boards for a long time. And I thought, oh, that's, that's important for me to be. And when I let that go and said, I'm just going to be a writer because I have things that I want to say, things really started to, like happiness started to find its way to me. And then, um, and then once I was being myself, doing what I really loved to do, it turned out, just opportunity after opportunity opened itself up. And I, like, I don't mean to suggest that I'm making anywhere near the kind of money I made when I was running a division of 400 people and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. But I also don't care that much about how much money I make. I care about being happy right now. There's one of these, there's one of these curious things about Bitcoin 
right? It, it is a, it's a trap that lures you. It lures the worst in you, right? It, it, people hear about Bitcoin and say, oh, you go there to get rich quick. That's what you're about. And th there's something that's true that people say, oh, this thing has gone up in price very quickly and I want lots of money. So you go in and then Bitcoin changes you. It's, you step into the trap and it slows down. You're no longer in a hurry. Everything's about low time preference, long time horizon, building things to last. And it's not about getting rich. It's about enriching the world. Um, one of my favorite essays that I wrote was called Rich or Poor Bitcoiners Have What Money Can't Buy. And it talks about how whether you have a lot of Bitcoin or not, the process of becoming a Bitcoiner is one of doing a lot of learning, a lot of exploration and, dis and coming to this decision that you want to be part of a system that's honest and going to be around for the long term and doesn't have corruption in it. And so if, that that makes you smarter. It makes you wiser. It gives you f friends who you can trust. And these are all things that money can't buy. Right? Like money can't buy smarts. Money can't buy friends. Money can't buy love. Uh, lots of people have pointed it out, but it it takes pointing out once again in our civilization because everybody's chasing those things that money can buy and thinking that it's going to buy them happiness, but it doesn't. Um, self esteem is where happiness comes from and self-esteem takes work it doesn't just show it doesn't just show up uh one minute you, you you have to do the work to figure out who you are and what you're great at and what you love yourself for and and the process of becoming a bitcoiner does that to people it puts people through this well is this for real is this a fraud and <laughs> i need to learn some math i need to learn some economics i need to ask a bunch of questions i need to learn to trust myself i need to learn how to verify other people's claims i need to be curious and smart and, and activate my brain i can't just sit back and take other people's word for it and all of these things are virtuous activities that uh, that end up giving you what what Money can't buy. You cannot walk into a store and buy intelligence or a friend. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Yeah. Just like a wonderful answer. And uh, I think it's interesting what you said, how a lot of people, when they first hear of Bitcoin, they're kind of attracted to it or they think it's a, you know, they're going to get rich quick or the price is going to go up. I've for many years, I've had this like underlying angst where I saw how hard my parents worked through the 1980s specifically. And uh, I remember my father getting up to put up drywall and he worked in Mississauga and he would get up early in the morning and he would work. And I remember the day that they paid off the mortgage on our, on our family home yeah. uh, and you know, how they kind of celebrated. And then I remember you know, he started his own business and there was really good times. And then 1990 hit and there was really brutal times where our family almost really lost everything. And um, so we kind of like as a family went through this like roller coaster. And I remember my father and mother, my mom had to work night shift. I remember one Christmas to have money to try to buy, I guess, myself and Nick Christmas presents. And so it was like this weird, like bountiful times and really kind of low yeah. times. And yeah. Um, I just remember, I don't know why, like, I just have this thought of how hard they worked. And if they had saved up $10,000 mm -hmm. that represented their time in labor, and I saw how hard they worked. And if they passed that on to my children, that yeah. $10,000 now, like in the year it's 2022, how it's not worth very much. And I saw how hard the struggle they went yeah. through to be able to pay off debts, to be able to save yeah. and to see that represented like that to me. And I, and I kind of just remember thinking that in like 2005 and 2010, and like, I just, I don't know why I always had this in the back of my, my mind that like the, the, what my parents did wasn't being, I don't want to say represented or wasn't being honored or wasn't, you know, it was being decayed. It was, it was kind of being stolen away and uh, it just bothered me. So when I saw first, you know, in 2008, the financial crisis made me kind of understand gold. Yeah. And then eventually I dismissed Bitcoin for many years. I didn't understand the scarcity. I didn't understand it. I just like, I literally laughed at one of my friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I told one of my and friends. It's very original and unique. It's not like anything that's ever come before. So it's the big mistake people make is they say, oh, it's like gold or it's like a company or it's like a charity or it's like a government. Well, it's not like any of these things. So you don't have a, 
it's it's totally alien right and uh and so you need to look at it for what it is because you can't just say oh it's like this other thing it's a unique yeah like thing. a stock like a yeah it's, it's like not stock, it's, right? not, it's not yeah it's, it's not no so then when i finally figured it out you know it was just like oh my gosh there's this thing and I know this is going to sound ridiculous for some of my friends who maybe are listening to this, but it was like this beacon of hope yeah. <laughs> or this signal of truth, you know, and I just, I just kind yeah. of felt like finally there's this right. thing and I don't really care about the price, mm -hmm. you know, and I, maybe, maybe I'm deceiving myself. Like, I guess I do feel much better when the price is going up than in Canadian dollars than when it's coming down. But I just thought, oh my gosh, but there's you're not this selling thing. when it's coming down. You're not panicking, no, right? I, there's this I think, anchor. I think that's the conviction, right? It's like, yeah, there's a there's a tremendous tidal wave or like a roller coaster ride happening off at the side. But you know you're a Bitcoiner if you've looked at all of this stuff and you say, you know, like I know what's going to happen in the long term. I'm not worried about what's happening in the short term, right? In the long term, this thing is is very valuable, not just in financial terms, but it's very valuable to the civilization. It it is something that encourages people to be honest, and in a sense, strongly discourages any dishonesty because dishonesty in the system is immediately caught out and immediately punished with rejection of the lie so there's no point in putting your energy into deception and it's built to last and you know like things that are built to last are actually really good they're better than disposable things especially if we claim that we care about the environment and nature right well filling garbage dumps up with disposable things that only last a day or a week or a month instead of years or decades that's um that's all bad stuff so you you quickly start moving away from i want to buy the things that our civilization has has told me that i should want to buy all these advertised disposable products this f mass consumption to just say what do i really want you know i want to be able to have stability i want to be able to save the proceeds of my work I, I want if i work hard to get paid in something that will be worth something in the future unlike what i saw happen to my parents in your case right where they worked so hard to save ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars will buy you i don't know it won't buy you a car anymore uh, it certainly won't buy you a house it won't make you a deposit on a house it might be a couple of months it's maybe a nice minutes. vacation yeah yeah, yeah. so i mean this is um this is really what's happened in our civilization where the ability to save and the ability to buy things that last for a long time and the ability to work on things that last a long time, all of that's been taken away by, you know, something that we don't really have time to go into in, in just an hour. But it doesn't matter that we can explain why all the causes were. It's like this new thing has come and it allows us to rebuild our civilization on longer time horizon, harder work, better work, more durable premises than money that the government prints at a whim to win an election and, and appease um, irritated mobs of people. And that's, and that's a very big difference. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly what happens, yeah. yeah. Um, why, I heard you say, I think it was, was, was with John Vallis. Why did you mention a black swan tattoo. I think you were just kind of joking, but it obviously had some meaning to you. Yeah, Why? Have I gotten a tattoo yet when I met with John? Because here it is. Right? Like, so no. I oh my gosh. I, I don't know if you, holy smokes. When did you get it? I followed through. I got it in December. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. okay so tell, I didn't know you actually got the tattoo. I didn't, maybe you had it that time. I, I was gonna, listening to the audio. Tells you he's going to do something. Yeah. 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 Okay. So something. tell why the, why the black swan tattoo? And because really that, that was interesting. That converse, that point in the conversation was interesting yeah. to me. There's really three reasons for it. I mean, the first is the story of the ugly duckling which is an old Hans Christian Andersen tale about this duckling that just that never fits in um, and is ugly and is, is mocked and made fun of. And, and then after his first season or first couple of seasons, he matures and it turns out he wasn't a duck after all. He was a beautiful swan and the swan's a gorgeous creature. And I went through a lot of this stuff myself. And, and I think finding my voice as a writer was me realizing that I was actually a writer not a businessman so all my life i was this 
conf- this businessman who didn't fit in on Bay Street, who didn't fit in on in, in the marketing departments, who didn't fit in ultimately. You put on the suit. You put on the suit, years. but you knew it didn't fit I, it right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it was. A, it was a black, you know, people. My HR person used to tell me I was a black sheep um, because I was. Uh, the the boardroom didn't really like me. They valued me because I would do these extraordinary things from time to time, but I really didn't fit in and I spoke my mind and I swore. And so I just wasn't like, I didn't fit in there, but it turns out. So, the, so the story of the ugly duckling is one of the things, the, the, the reason it's a black swan is the, there's a book called the black, <laughs> the black swan, which is about the black swans are rare, but they do exist. And these events happen these black swan events happen rarely, but when they do, they're very big events. And it's a book I recommend people read. And um, and I really feel that Bitcoin is this black swan event. And so here I am, a swan as part of the black swan thing. And then and then kind of the cherry on top, of course, is the company, the Bitcoin company that ended up. Um, being oh my gosh! Bitcoin yeah, I didn't even I connect the dots it's, there. I didn't even connect swan. the dots there. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the whole. I, I'd always I'd always admired this black swan thing um but the fact that uh, i find myself employed or working with uh swan bitcoin as well it was just it sealed the deal it was the perfect trinity the trifecta of, of it and so i had um i just had to find a decent artist who could draw a badass black swan i wanted it to be badass and uh, and i got it and uh and i'm really happy with it yeah you should be wow what a great story that's interesting. Just from hearing you talk about surrendering yourself in 2020 to the point of 2022 or late 2021, having a black swan tattoo, that's like a year and a half. What is that? A year yeah, and a half. Even, it, you know, I it's think like, it's even less because um, I really only started. Writing oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was the fall. It wasn't, of, it wasn't until 2021. Like my first, if you take a look at my medium, the first of the Why Bitcoin series, I think I published in March of 2021. And so by December, Wow! I'd already published that, made an ebook out of it. I had a, I made a movie. I'd written a whole bunch of things beyond the Why Bitcoin series. I connected with Swan. I, I gotten involved in these Toronto um, Bitcoin meetups. Made a lot of new friends. I like it was a huge year of change. It was like a tremendous, tremendous year, and it was, it was a Black Swan year for me. And it was the identification of this. Um, this is who I am. And like, I really feel natural in, in speaking about the values that Bitcoin allows one to pursue and preserve. And I feel comfortable in having a voice and speaking about Bitcoin and in being held to account as a Bitcoiner, you know, Bitcoiners have this slogan that says, don't trust verify. And, <laughs> and so if you put something out, you know, the community is going to verify, uh, what you say. So there's a expectation of truth telling. And, and a big part, the biggest part of truth telling is saying, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. Here's something that I think I know. And just being humble enough about that to say, does, it, does this make sense? I think, I think this makes sense rather than to come in and say, this is the way it is. Right? This is the way it is, is, is making a decree, right? Which is, which in Latin is fiat, which is the antithesis of what Bitcoin is. Right? It's, it's proof and truth rather than decree arbitrary decrees so is that why and i guess we can some of your 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 essays are really taking some of the big components of bitcoin and breaking them down so kind of beautifully in in such a short way but one of them is you know what you have this one kind of sentence and about proof of work and it says why is money that is difficult to produce a good thing like that's kind of like the idea that you're exploring there um can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I think some people who are new to Bitcoin will still hear this idea. They'll hear this term proof of work. And then the, the only other thing they might know about that is that um, it gets negative headlines from like, there's a lot of energy used to create Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and I guess I like that specific essay um, that you have in your series. Is that it's talking why about it the- takes time and energy to make Bitcoin? Yeah, so- yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk about that point specifically? Yeah. I, like it is, it's a very simple point. I don't need to get too philosophical about it. Like you work hard for your money and it takes time to earn your money. So isn't it only fair that the money that you get paid with also takes work and time to make? 
And that's what proof of work is, right? Proof of work ensures that people have to work to create Bitcoin and they can only create a certain amount over a certain period of time. And that's what gives money its integrity. Like when you have to work 40 hours a week to make a bunch of money, let's say it's $1,000, and then the government can print a trillion dollars without any work in no time instantly and flood the system with money. And now the $10,000 that you worked 10 weeks for doesn't buy what it used to buy. That's injustice, right? And, and what Bitcoin does is it takes the power to print money out of anybody's hands. There's nobody in charge of Bitcoin. There is this algorithm proof of work that adjusts its difficulty depending on how much work people are putting into it to ensure that only a certain number of Bitcoin are made on average every 10 minutes and that that amount keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this is money that requires time and energy to make, which is what you trade your time and energy for, right? You, you, you work and you trade your time and energy for money. If you're trading, so you should be trading it for something that takes time and energy to make. And if you're not, you're getting ripped off. Right, like that, that's what it comes down to. And that's the big lie in our civilization. We, tr we trade our time and energy for pieces of papers or entries on the computer that don't take time and energy to make. And so there's people on the other side of that who have, how did they get this money? Well, they didn't work for it. They decreed it into existence. And, th and that's a big difference between, and th this is why people like gold, right? Because gold takes time and energy to make, but the Bitcoin has a, big trump card that it plays on top of gold or, or a few it just has such a dominant hand over gold because for one for one it's actually the energy that it uses is good for the for the environment you can use clean energy whereas if you're using energy to mine gold you're digging up you're you know you're, you're doing something that's very pollutive and you're digging up tons and tons and tons of earth to extract you know this one or two ounces of gold from the ton of earth because the gold is so scarce and rare in it, uh, but gold also suffers from the fact that it can be taken by force and many, many wars have been fought over gold and gold is very hard to send and it's very hard to verify and it's very hard to divide and it's very hard, like, there's just all sorts of problems with gold. It's hard to know if it's pure, whereas Bitcoin is very easy to protect. It can't be stolen by force. I mean, you can kill me if I had gold on me, you could take my gold, but if I own Bitcoin, you can't take my Bitcoin by killing me. Right? It's, it's the most secure form of property that's ever existed. And it's easy to divide. It's easy to verify the truth of it. Every Bitcoin, you know, gold says, nine, really fine gold coins say 99.99% pure. Look, every Bitcoin transaction consists of 100% pure Bitcoin and nothing else, right? Um, and, so, and so you can verify easily with a basic computer, which is a tool that everybody in the world has. To verify a piece of gold, you need some really fancy equipment, <laughs> equipment yeah, yeah. It's lasers and this costs yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. And the only thing it does is, is validate whether a piece of metal is actually in fact gold and you have to damage the gold in the process. So it's like Bitcoin is just so much easier to use. It's worldwide. It'll last forever. There's no inflate. Gold also inflates at one to 2% per year. Bitcoin, the amount is known. It's, it's concise. Nobody can ever create any more. So it's a perfect container for all the world's money supply. So Bitcoin is just perfected money. And the tremendous innovation about it is one of the things we needed money to do is to not be in the hands of people who could create it without mm -hmm. work, without time. I think that's the that's point. that's what Bitcoin in, fixes. Yeah. And that's the point you made when you wrote so simply that like we work for our money but other people in the current system can just be given some money out of thin air. So there's a class of people that are working 40 hours a week or more for their money. And there's different people who have different access to money that they're just given it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's such a, such a, like a beautifully simple way to describe the problem. And uh, sometimes I think of that with real estate, because I'm like, this is crazy that I can go to a bank and refinance a property, sign a piece of paper and pull out, yeah. you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. More money. How, yeah. And, and, and I've created an economy. The bank just says, Oh, you know, like you have this much income and you want to, and you can service the debt on it. We'll give it to you in exchange for this house. Um, and no, no new value was created, but they inflated the money supply and the price of a house. So now a house is more unaffordable or requires that you get deeper and deeper into debt to purchase it. And they're the ones who created the money without doing any work. Like, unless you consider, you've got to work for 30 years now to pay off this house. 
and they, with money that they created by signing a piece of paper. You, like there's one thing that Bitcoin fixes, like, you know, it, it's it's an atom bomb of fix, right? Like it is just, it's huge and colossal in, in what it fixes. And no wonder the banks have, have continuously outperformed the growth in the economy. Sure. How could finance yeah. outperform the growth in the economy? <laughs> they well, have no because inventory it's a rent seeker. Yeah. They're, they're inflating the money supply, keeping a chunk of it. And so it, it's like the, their days are numbered in being rent seekers and taking advantage of people. And of course, do, Bitcoin do you also lets you be your own bank. Do you, and so do you think there, because like sometimes I, I think about that. I'm like, are, is, is Bitcoin like kind of starving the beast? Like, do you think Bitcoin has the ability to really change the institutions around us in our lifetime? Oh, yeah. Look at what the internet did. Um, and, and the internet came up at a time when technology was even slower because we didn't have the internet. Um, and media is totally transformed. Telecommunications is totally transformed. Like you're probably old enough to remember using a rotary phone or mm -hmm. at least a touch tone phone where the appliance, <laughs> there was an appliance that was nothing but a phone and, and it didn't have all these wonderful features and you had to memorize people's phone numbers, right? Like you, you didn't just tell the phone call. There was a busy Tom. signal. Yeah, right? yeah, there was yeah, a, yeah. If they were, and if they weren't there, they missed the call, or there was a tape. You know, eventually we invented a tape machine that recorded the call, and you had to listen to the outgoing message. And like, you know, so the so all of these and all these institutions have been fundamentally transformed. Some not for the better, some for the worse. But when ch disruptive change happens, everything changes in an industry, and um, and we're going through this tremendous digital transformation of our civilization and this is perhaps the most important thing because if we didn't have sound money sound digital money the direction that our digital transformation of our civilization is headed in is a very bad one it's a bad one for like individual human beings it's a bad one for humanity as a whole it's a bad one for the planet as a whole like we're We've got this metaverse notion, which is this terrible idea of a world where like you literally, you're literally plugging into the matrix, which was a, right, it was a dystopia where you're putting something over your eyes to substitute the reality in front of you. You're putting something over your ears. You're abandoning the sense of smell and taste and touch in, in this metaphor for low res graphics of stuff that isn't real. And it disconnects us from reality. And everything that is going on in this digital realm ends up becoming further and further slippage into uh, like filter bubbles where you end up only seeing the kinds of things that the algorithms think will in like motivate you, but it, it turns out radicalizing you and there's no way to stop it or fix it. And all of these things are because not because you're in charge, you're not in charge in the whole digital realm. You're the product in the digital realm. These are attention seeking companies because they make money off of Advertise, selling advertisements to you that actually affect you. So it's not like you're consciously deciding what you want to do. You're being manipulated co continuously, not by individuals who are evil, but by algorithms that are finely tuned towards manipulating you and, and are effective at manipulating you. And we need a way out of that. And part of it is we just, we need to stop being the product. We, we need to step out and be the human beings. And Bitcoin actually... You know, it's amazing to say like how so how again does Bitcoin enable that? Well, it allows us to have this decentralized everything, um, and it allows us to actually pay for things on the internet in ways that is is with honest money. You know, we can run our own servers, we can run our own platforms, or we can pay for platforms to remove all the advertising and algorithms and tr and start to transform it away from these social media empires that belong to people who don't really seem to care about people, right? I, there was a recent headline that called Bitcoin psychopaths, which mm -hmm. is, we always embrace every slur that's thrown at us. So. Yeah, and I think yesterday, financially illiterate, wasn't it the Bank of Canada? And yeah, the Globe and Mail yeah put so some financially money. illiterate So now it's a financially illiterate. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and, and here I said before, like Bitcoiners study finance and economics more so than any uh, university degree. I have a university degree in economics. Um, I, I could tell it, I was being fed horse shit the whole time I was sitting in there and now Bitcoiners are getting the truth and um, and Bitcoiners actually really care about people right like everything that I've talked about here I'm talking about people being able to keep what they earn and to be fairly paid whereas if this is 
not the opposite of that, but like I wonder about someone like Mark Zuckerberg and certainly the machinations of decisions at companies like Facebook where they don't just sell advertising to help you to, to get you to buy something that you need, right? They manipulated people's political opinions by selling data to Cambridge Analytica and, and all of this uh, all of this polarization benefits them and one it benefits them financially directly it also creates a added engagement when everybody's constantly fighting a political battle on social media saying this person's evil that person's bad like the divisiveness that this business model creates in our civilization because it strives for engagement and you only engage when you're enraged right so it's enragement and engagement that these things and and at some point, the buck has to stop at a human being. Like, I, I'm, I don't want to give all these excuses to, well, that's just the way the algorithms work. Like, you, you, choose, you end up with a big responsibility when you're the founder of Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or Google. You've got all the world's information, and, and you make decisions about what people will monetize and what will happen. And when you make decisions that say, we will put maximizing short-term profit over human beings mental health and well-being and the incitement of war and stuff you're a psychopath that's um you've you've now fit the bill of not caring about other people and just pursuing your own fortune at the expense of others and you wonder like and how much of a and and the other thing that's insane about it is like and how much money do you need like when you got a billion dollars there's no way to spend it all when you got a hundred billion dollars you can't spend it all in a in a hundred lifetimes. So what what's going on there, right? And and this isn't then to call out those people as evil. It's to say they're kind of crazy. They they've lost their minds in a sense, right? Like they've at some point you should you, like you should just say, oh, I've got enough money to do whatever it is that my dream is, rather than I need to continually optimize this thing at the expense of all these human beings who are users of my product so that I can have even more money that I don't know what to do with. That's the trap that the, these multi-billionaire yeah, tech it's interesting. all seem yeah. to have fallen into. Ja yeah, and out. the one that seems like he pulled himself out of it would be Jack Dorsey, I you think. You bet, yeah. Jack Dorsey's it's, woke, right? He woke up. Um, and Bitcoin's the thing that woke him up. So It here, seems like, that way, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah. There's, there's no denying it. He saw where everything was headed. He saw, and he opened his eyes and he saw the tragedies in Africa and the tragedies in South Central America. And he saw the collapse of the American empire. And he realized that the company that he founded was playing a part in all of this. And, and he saw that there was a solution in, in decentralization in taking away, not in finding someone more benevolent to be the ruler, but in saying, let's not have a ruler. Let's, let's not mm -hmm. put somebody in that position of so much power that they somehow can fix the thing. Because I think part of what he realizes, no one person can fix this thing. It's too complicated to, for anybody to bear on their shoulders. What we need to do is disband it, decentralize it, put everyone in charge of their own destiny. Let the individual be in charge. And it's interesting. So I... It would one way that if you look at something like Twitter, instead of, you know how now everyone's talking about how Elon Musk is trying to buy it and stuff, and then mm -hmm. he might, you yeah. know, get everybody, all the bots, but he would try yeah. to fix all well, the- You better all publish the... this quick, because within a week and a half, he'll either not be interested or he'll already- Yeah, yeah, but I'm, no, I'm, but I'm just thinking about Bitcoin. Instead of ever getting everyone's identity into digital media, um, wouldn't one way, and I think it was mentioned by someone on Twitter, I don't know who to give credit Michael to. Michael Saylor. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, how could I forget it was Michael? Of course it was Michael Saylor who had this thing. But uh, anyway, is that a way that Bitcoin fixes things? And for those of you who did not see that tweet, I think he mentions basically you could just put a bit of a bit of Bitcoin, so some sats, kind of like a deposit. And then that yeah. way you get rid of a lot of the spam because if you put right, a deposit because, because like Because if someone's a spammer, you confiscate the deposit. You confiscate the, 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 right. the sats. Yeah, so it, I, I, I do think that that's a very... Um, valid way and, and and part of what it does this way is it keeps your privacy because you can now create a new identity yeah exactly and, yes and you can post you can say what's on your mind without getting canceled or without getting exposed and and you've staked some money behind it so that if if what you're saying turns out to be scams and lies and stuff you're actually will lose that little bit of money 
but you haven't had to you haven't had to step into the fray today of what it is so difficult which is if you say something that somebody doesn't like you might get fired from your job and yeah. and this isn't just this isn't like something that you should get fired from your job for this is something that just isn't politically popular right now like we had these tremendous um protests in canada and the trucker protests against the mandated vaccines and whether you favor max vaccines or not the punishment that these people received without any trial without any charges being laid was you know like first of all the vaccine mandate said you either get the vaccine or you can't do your job so they were essentially fired from their jobs right like, even though they weren't working for the government but the government stepped in and said do what we say or you can't work for a living anymore so that there's another problem that bitcoin fixes um and and then um and then the government invoked the emergency measures act and froze their bank accounts another problem that bitcoin solved and didn't give them an opportunity um to ha have a hearing trudeau wouldn't even meet with them so like all of this stuff just shows how vulnerable systems with leaders are and and this is the brilliant invention about bitcoin and why it's not like anything you've ever seen before is it has no leaders it has no leadership it has nobody in charge it's this amazing amazing invention that requires consensus on from everybody to make any changes which is almost impossible to achieve and has very just rules to begin with so that everyone can play by the same rules forever um and it's a that's the extraordinary nature of this thing so when i asked you earlier if you thought bitcoin could really kind of change things moving forward your answer was yes because now it's layered on top of the internet which is already developed i might be summarizing incorrectly there yeah, but uh true. so you think in the next five years we might see a lot of differences in just finance money communication perhaps yeah i you know it's hard to know the exact timing of when big leaps happen i i remember the most amazing thing that happened with the penetration of the internet is like you know the internet started going and there was dial up and then there was some high speed and then there was a dot com boom and then dot com bust and everybody in business kind of said well the internet went away that's over and, yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, like it was over and the Nasdaq certainly had not recovered. It fell from 5,000 to 1,000 and, uh, you know, in, by 2004, it was maybe at 1,300 or 1,400. It was like, you know, if you had invested in all these dot-com IPOs, you still lost your shirt. You lost 75% of your money. So a lot of business people thought the internet went away. And then um, and then BlackBerry came out with this little device uh, that was kind of an email yeah. pocket. <laughs> And everybody became addicted to it. It ended up having a nickname called the Crackberry. But it was that's right. I forgot about it. I forgot about, it. Then, I forgot about that. Yeah. Right. And then they had this consumer version of it. I can't remember exactly what they called it, but it looked more like a phone than a than a little portable computer. And it was kind of one of these things. Like suddenly, everybody had a mobile wearable computer that they were using to wirelessly connect to the internet, and nobody noticed. Right? Nobody said, oh my God, the world has changed. We're all connecting wirelessly to the internet using wearable computers that are battery powered. Nobody said that. The term smartphone started to get thrown around and then Apple, of course, released the iPhone and, and then the whole world went haywire. And, and then we really started to move quickly into a totally digital world where there was an app for everything. But it was more like you turned backwards and you said, wow, the world changed and I never really noticed, right? It suddenly, it suddenly happened. And I think this is the way that these technological revolutions do happen. It's, you know, there are people who are early adopters and they're trying to get these things, but like, remember when not all TVs were flat screens? <laughs> remember when they were cathode ray tubes? Do you remember when they went away? Like, I don't remember when they went away. I just remember the flat ones started to get more and more affordable and then they became high definition so the the ratio of the screen size changed and it just uh, suddenly one day you never saw a, a crt tv <laughs> you never saw a thick tube tv anymore anywhere yeah i got it yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, so and i think this is really starting to quickly happen with bitcoin now like i remember when i first saw bitcoin and it was like oh this is like the internet back when before H, before the World Wide Web, there was an internet before the where it was just mail and things, something called FTP and something else called NNTP. And we still use the mail protocol, but we don't use the other two protocols anymore because HTTP replaced both of them in time. 
uh, there was even a protocol called Gopher over the internet. But um, it's the, everything changed. And I think this is what's happening really, really quickly with Bitcoin. Like now that the Lightning Network exists and this thing has spread all over the place, it really is extraordinary. Like Bitcoin is operating in every country in the world without any blessing of any government in the world. It's like it's taken over the world. Um, it hasn't it hasn't taken dominance and it, it hasn't forced a single person in the world to use it. Bitcoin's a completely voluntary uh, movement. So only people who want to use it can use it. That's part of the beauty of the system. It's completely consensual. Um, unlike the fiat money system, which is if like, if you don't use this money, you go to jail, they'll throw you in a cage, maybe even shoot you a little bit. Right. So like, this is, this is the beauty of this thing. And, um, and I think, I think the world will change really quickly. It won't be that, you know, three years from now, I don't think three years from now, fiat money will be gone and banks will be gone. Sure. But yeah. a lot of these things, um, that existed before the internet became very, very thin shadows of themselves like there's there's still encyclopedia britannica but none mm. of us have a set of a 24 books at home that our parents worked for weeks my parents months. house might still have one actually but you're right yeah 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 yeah. yeah. like so the, but now that they're, they're collector's items they're not information sources yeah that's they, true they changed yeah. what they are and in the same way that candles aren't lighting anymore candles are mood lighting right and the yeah. electric you've yeah, got yeah, a light yeah. bulb behind you right drawn on the yeah. walls so it's like yeah the light bulb changed lighting and the internet changed information and bitcoin changes finance all in the same or similar ways they fundamentally take away the power from the old and yeah i remember when i got it. my first job from university um it was at the royal bank in the it department on front street and when i got there i guess it was like 98 98 or 99 98 mm -hmm. 98 1998 and there was an intranet do you yeah. remember the yeah, intranet yeah, remember intranets these were yeah. gonna be big things they went away yeah and and it, it, i remember logging in and you got like the sports news and you got like the news and the company information but it was on a website that was in so for those of yeah. you listening don't know what it is it was like for this, a problem it was like it. yeah it was like this yeah, little closed int internet that was right. closed to the community of royal yeah. bank employees That's like what private blockchains are right like yeah yeah and i, I just feel the, the internet intranets of the digital yeah and i look at the fiat solution. system as like a closed mod so to me i guess the analogy is i'm like oh like the open internet just crushed the intranet like because nobody mm -hmm. ran their own closed systems right. anymore because the open network was just so much more powerful and developing so quick and you could get the information yeah. faster and better communicate more effectively and i look at just bitcoin i'm like oh Okay, there's like an open monetary system, which to me is like more like the internet and the old fiat yeah. system, like the Canadian dollar is more like the intranet, which was like yeah, closed it's, it's into this. Worse, yeah, 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 or, yeah. So I'm like, oh, obviously worse, Bitcoin's yeah. just going to win because right. the open right. network. In just hindsight, it was it will have been inevitable. People will say, like our kids will say, or our grandkids, depending on what age your kids already are, they'll say like. Are, are you kidding me? Like you use pieces of paper that one person could print as money. Like, didn't that person just print lots and lots more of the money and keep it for themselves? It's like, yeah, they did. It was really horrible. We, we were, our whole civilization was impoverished by it. Um, and it nearly brought our civilization to its knees. And they're like, why? I was like, well, they forced us at the point of a gun. They, they took over all the money in 1971 and they said that money wasn't going to be backed by gold anymore. But why did you accept it? We didn't want a war. We didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you use Bitcoin? We had to pay sooner? our taxes. We had to yeah. pay our taxes right. in it. At the point of a gun, right? Like, wh yeah, why yeah. didn't you do something sooner? Well, we didn't know how to invent Bitcoin. Well, but when Bitcoin was invented, why didn't you adopt it sooner? Because it was really confusing and hard to learn. But it's so obvious that you... Well, it wasn't it wasn't that obvious to us. Right. And it's like th this is the nature of how a civilization yeah. evolves that, you know, I, I'm a Bitcoin educator. I spend all my time thinking of different ways to tell people <laughs> that Bitcoin is good. Honestly, right. Not I'm not I, I could spend all my time making up lies and saying it does something that it doesn't do, but I'm presenting it unvarnished as it is because it's very, very good 
as it is. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm doing a lot of battle with a lot of people who are lying about Bitcoin's imitators, which, are, which don't do any of the good things that Bitcoin does, but pretend to be in the same space. Yeah. How did you understand that all the way back in 2013, you said that you already understood some of the other altcoins were not um, the way to go. Well, like, what was I your mean, thinking? Like, the manner in which Bitcoin was created is, is this once in the millennia type uh, thing, right? Someone mysterious showed up Nobody asked him to invent Bitcoin, but he, he invented it and he never revealed who he was and he didn't, he didn't print money for himself. He didn't become an equity holder. He didn't exercise power over it. He didn't seek fame. He hid his identity and then disappeared and left all his coins behind um, to, for nobody to ever use. So there's just this extraordinary... And so when you study the in, just the invention of Bitcoin, here's someone who came around with a brilliant invention. It's so brilliant. People think he must have been a space alien or, you know, a divine yeah, or something. Yes, right? it was that it's, brilliant. It's so yes. extraordinary. I, I have one article called Why People Wonder uh, If Bitcoin is Alien Technology. And I kind of point out these five or six different things that this technology does that no other human technology ever did before. People really like that article. So I, I, I'm just dropping a name for it and you can put it in the show notes. Yeah, that's um, great. I but will. he does he does these things and then unlike any greedy human being he leaves all the money behind he doesn't pursue power he doesn't pursue uh fame and and vanishes forever after he does this and um and every other altcoin is exactly the opposite it's somebody created a whole bunch of coins for themselves and is now trying to push them on you and saying mine is better than bitcoin and, and we know who they are and they're clearly greedy and they and they show pictures of themselves meeting and ha hanging out with f celebrities and powerful people. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between somebody who's a greedy, lying slob and somebody who is an extraordinary genius of, of incredible humility. And, and then you see what ends up happening over time. Bitcoin keeps going up and up and up in price and has more and more and more integrity and never violates any of its promises. And all these other things, they have to be restarted. They have to be hard forked, which is essentially like a, a change or, they, or the leadership chooses to hard fork it to keep themselves rich. And you end up seeing, oh, you know, these other systems are just other people trying to recreate the broken money system that we already have, but be, be the people in power. They like the idea of someone being in charge. They just like the idea of it being them. Bitcoiners like the idea of nobody being in charge, the fairness of it. And that is this big difference between Bitcoin and every single other project that's out there that claims to be in the space of crypto. Yeah, because I guess someone can make another project of something, but you don't need another monetary instrument to be your representation of value. Like, sure, I don't know you if Bitcoin. you want to go... Like what, You've got and, Bitcoin. And like Bitcoin perfect could be... integrity and flawlessness and built to last forever. It's not like... It's not like Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator, left it broken for us. He, you know, he created something that, that works. So anytime someone creates an imitation of it, they're literally trying to reinvent the wheel. And, and when they say, oh, it's a little bit faster, it's a little, they're, they know they're missing the point in most of these cases. Like the point isn't that it's faster. The point is that it has integrity, that it can't be inflated, that nobody's in charge. It's like, I'm in charge and I made it faster. Well, you've ruined it right like the, mm -hmm. the speed was not the problem nobody being in charge was the problem that it fixed and now by yeah. being and in I guess charge for, you've ruined it and there's so much that bitcoin did but i guess for anyone listening to this i guess one of the biggest things for me was when i was at oracle i would work with some financial institutions and we would talk about the database and being able to lock a specific block of data in the database so that no one else could update it if somebody was first updating it so if somebody was changing the balance of something mm -hmm. No one else could get incorrect information. That little piece of data was locked literally at the block level on the disk at that time. And that was like a really big deal for proper database technology. Otherwise, you would have people overwriting information and no one would know it what would the single point of truth was. It would be uh, completely out of sync. Know, so in database truth. technology, this was literally a really critical point of the database, the ability to have like a single point of truth and and what what Bitcoin did and what Satoshi Nakamoto did was be able to do that, but in a distributed fashion where multiple ledgers all around the world could have a single is, point of truth. Yeah, yeah. And it was so that, and that also presents no single point of failure then. Right. And in one of your essays, you, you talk about um, why can nobody stop the Bitcoin in the nodes? Yeah. um about that 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 just the that structure is to me just blows me away every time i think about it 
It's incredible. You know, like it blows. Yeah, the, the, these things when people start to look at them. I know we're running short on time. When people start, no, to look I'm at them, I'm good for time. Don't worry. As okay. long as you're good for time, I'm good for time. Yeah. So just when keep, people start keep to going. look at things like how Bitcoin works and how it achieves these solutions of uh, of multiple copies of the database everywhere and anywhere with no one of them being a master and all of them being identical. This is where they start to say like, whoa, this is, I never, I, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. This has to be aliens that invented this. No, how can any human being have come up with it? Um, it, it is it like, what's going on it, it, it's here? It's literally is, mind is blowing. Thing al- and you can't stop it and it's operating and it's updating. So like, is the thing alive? Like people just start to have these, all these different epiphanies because it starts to cross over from computer science into economics and philosophy and morality and ethics and and like and and longevity (laughs) yeah the bitcoin rabbit hole and um and this is just such an extraordinary invention like you can imagine what it might have been like the first time fire was discovered yeah you you just walked around and the temperature was what it was yeah yeah. it was cold it was (laughs) it was cold and um and you you had to protect yourself with a spear or a rock or something and then suddenly fire exists and you can be warm anytime you want and you can cook food and it and you don't need to have a lot of body hair to stay warm you like we're we're all bald creatures right now because we, we must have evolved around fire to, it no longer being necessary to have hair um so hair just became a signal of health in, in certain parts on your body or maturity rather than um it was this essential thing to keep you warm right it adapted and um and so fire just changed us so much and this really feels like once you start to look at it i know to, to people who are outsiders it's like this is just a piece of software <laughs> you it's sound like a, a yeah of, yeah like no. it's not just a piece of software any more than fire is just hydrocarbon interacting with oxygen right like and, and a spark there's something really and fire like many people would have mistaken fire to be a lo- a living thing like it needs food to keep going and it, so that it, it's lifelike in a certain way and and bitcoin is lifelike in a certain way if, if you don't accept that it's quite alive but it's it's fire like um it both in terms of the fact that it's an ongoing process that feeds off of energy and uh and it's something that is going to change humanity profoundly and dramatically over tens of thousands of years like that's very freeing too like i i travel to croatia every summer with the family and just knowing that i have access to bitcoin anywhere i am in the world yeah. is very freeing because before when i would travel i would carry canadian doll like and i still do but yeah. but but you know canadian dollars and euros and the local currency there is kuna mm-hmm. because nobody trusts the local currency and right. actually a bank last year went out of business in Croatia that my yeah. brother-in-law was using the bank right. just kind of shut down. I think he lost a few hundred euro there. Like Canadians mm-hmm. don't even, can't even conceptualize it. Really that like happens. That happened. Yeah. That, that happened. happened in the eighties here in Canada. People don't remember, but yeah, yeah it's like a foreign concept. seven banks. We now have only five. <laughs> who was who, who, who in the eighties? I don't remember. Was there other banks that I'm forgetting? Yeah. I forget, I forget their names now. But one oh, I'm going to have to figure that out. And, and, okay. And, but but yeah, so it's a foreign concept. But it's very freeing to know that like, oh my gosh, I can put some amount of Bitcoin on maybe a less secure uh, form of storage on my phone just mm-hmm. to have a small amount just that I have easily accessible like right mm-hmm. on me at all times and I could yeah, have a different incredible. way to store it. I was in it just, Miami um, for the Bitcoin conference a couple of weeks ago. I was there too. I was there too. Right. I was, I, we didn't and everybody paths, was, but yeah. everybody was using lightning to pay each other, right? I was selling my boat yeah. and uh, most, like a few people said, will you accept cash? And I said, yeah, I'll take cash, but I prefer lightning. <laughs> and most people paid me in lightning and I'm very happy to accept Bitcoin. And they were very happy to spend a little bit of Bitcoin, especially have the experience of being one of the early users of lightning to pay for something and like this is how far it's come right in in 2010 the first bitcoin transaction happened someone paid 10,000 bitcoin for two papa john's pizzas and meanwhile at the bitcoin conference in miami every second there were dozens of transactions going on people paying for this that the other and the thing had scaled you know and and had obviously scaled to be bigger than any other altcoin in comparison because the lightning network's just so transparent and so fluid and so liquid and has such high capacity we were you know we already it's already proven itself out to be the dominant of these um of of all of these things that 
that allegedly compete with it. So it's it's kind of game over, right? And, and it's it's like the internet beat out all the other networks, and Bitcoin is the money of the internet, and mm-hmm. it's going to beat out all the other monetary n- networks. Yeah, I, I, people I, don't I, understand that or don't believe it, but it's like. I almost like feel done. fortunate to have gone through the tech cycle and work at Oracle and database company because I feel like it's given me some perspective on the technology side of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Aside from the monetary side of it, it's been kind of helpful to see that because around the years 2000 to 2005, um, I saw I, I sold databases to companies that were still building, but at the financial level, everybody thought the internet was dead. But right. we were selling database technology. Yeah. You could see underneath, like all these companies were putting more that and more it. information in these databases. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, NetSuite and Salesforce.com were like just born and the information mm-hmm. just became free. And like CRM yeah. data was now available to every salesperson on their laptop as they traveled yeah. with a web interface. And it just went from like, oh, this is client server architecture that is old yeah. and crappy. And then almost overnight, the everyone's like, whoa. Yeah. yeah, like the cloud was just born, but it was underneath, it was building and building. And I feel the like the thing. Lightning Network is very much like that. I think like it's building exactly and building it, and building. Right. It's, it's when this is the same point as what we talked about when you turn around and everything's ubiquitous, right? It's like if you, yeah, I can, it used to be that if I wanted to tell someone, oh, you, you should get Bitcoin, like it was a really complicated thing. You need to get your laptop, you need to install yes. software, you need to download it, <laughs> you need to sync it, right? It would take days. And now I'm, I can be at a restaurant and I can, tell the server, I'd say, would you like me to tip you in Bitcoin at the end of the meal? And they'll say, yeah, I'm curious. Or like, or they might ask, and I say, download this app. And when the meal is over, I send them a lightning transaction for their tip. And now they've got Bitcoin. And that is a huge Our difference. Right? Do you have a favorite one? I get people to just quickly download for me. My, my, the easiest one on that for me is I just say, hey, download the Blue Wallet and I can get them to set it up. Do you have a, a different one that you I like? generally recommend with Wallet of Satoshi, but like not because I okay. think it's any better or any different. I know Moon Wallet, I'm just giving a plug. Moon, to all of yeah, these. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these are all perfectly sensible starting points for having an on-chain and a, and a lightning capable wallet on your phone. Yeah. It's, it's they're, they're still the custodians in most of these cases, unless you do something sophisticated, but to get somebody started and be able to give somebody Bitcoin and, oh, and have them, so powerful, bi- have Bitcoin that they can spend. Like I, I, and I think this is really, this is really cool when you're dealing with somebody who probably is sending some of their money back home to family yeah. or, um, or doesn't really have a bank account and doesn't have visa, which, which you encounter a lot when you're dealing with tradespeople or, servers at at restaurants right like there's um there's just a real challenge (laughs) i had this um i had this wonderful moment i i got invited to michael saylor's house at uh, the bitcoin miami did you barbecue for a barbecue it was on the saturday and so and so there were a few um a few guys working chefs right working the barbecue and somehow while i was waiting for the burger to get ready the discussion came up about bitcoin and they didn't have it so i said download this wallet and they did i waited for the crowd to clear up so that i didn't argue anything but then i came back and i sent them each like 15 dollars of bitcoin on um on their wallet and i was explaining it and like it it wasn't a big crowd that was around there but it's like the who's who of bitcoin people watching these um these foreign workers get get orange pilled and get their very first Bitcoin. So it was kind of, it was kind of like a surreal, <laughs> a special moment. Uh, there was, there was kind of awesome. So I, I try to do this everywhere I go. I just, any opportunity I have to introduce somebody to Bitcoin, um, I try and, and I try to listen to them I, and hear what their challenges are with money in the world and, and explain how Bitcoin fixes that for them. Cause it fixes so many different things in so many different ways. Elmer, with all your essays, I know now we can talk about your book as well, but on the on, on the different writings that you've done, are there some that you really like that you would call out for anyone listening to this that you're like, oh my gosh, I, like that one I really personally enjoy. It could be very selfish of you, just ones yeah. that you enjoy. Okay. Are there ones that you could call out? Because maybe I'll link specifically to a few in the show notes of this article yeah. instead of the, it depends you know, on the, the audience. whole series. Right, like yeah, it, but it just really ones that you like. On what are audience. what are ones that you like? You mentioned I mean, the alien me, one. one of my one of my absolute favorites is the alien technology one, right? Okay, why, so why I'll link specifically wonder, to why that people one. wonder if Bitcoin is alien technology. Okay, is, okay, uh, is really cool, and it's for people who know a little bit about Bitcoin. But it's it it explains all these different things that Bitcoin does that no other technology does. It doesn't explain how they do them all, 
so it's accessible to everybody because you don't need to know the math behind Bitcoin to understand that it does these really freaky things um, that that people thought were impossible until Bitcoin showed up and did all of them all at once. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so that I think that one's kind of really fun uh, without being uh, without being too deep. Um, I there's one if you're linking on the medium site there's one whose whose name I changed in the book but in on the medium site it's called why everything that should hurt bitcoin only makes it stronger and um that's a really short one and and it introduces this concept of you know bitcoin gets stronger by being attacked and so I, many people are worried won't the government stop it and it's like oh the more the government tries to stop it the stronger bitcoin gets and that's something that people don't understand particularly well either so okay so that's a great one for everyone to read yeah okay yeah, that's a really that's a really good one um i've written so much i know you have words. you really I have, my you have. So there's my medium i've got a lot of articles published on the swan blog which is swan.com slash signal and that's all uh, that's all different content on the swan yeah, blog? It's not, there's nothing that's repurposed okay. between the two okay. I, i'm gonna start republishing a lot of my content kind of cross posting it but it's it kind of all lives in different places um there's there's some kind of esoteric stuff that I, I it's probably not necessarily for your audience like but on my medium don't say it you're structured. smiling about it you say it please no. what is it <laughs> there's a piece about satoshi nakamoto on a publication called citadel 21 called satoshi and me so if you google satoshi and me and tomer strolite you'll find it it's it's got some um it's got a bunch of f-bombs in the first paragraph and then it kind of settles down but it's it's a time. It's a science fiction time travel love story. I don't know how else to describe okay. it. Okay, I'm gonna. I haven't read that one. You're. We're allowed to swear, so don't. Yeah. The f bombs oh, are fine. So this one's quite, uh, quite vivid. I have to read it by looking at the expression on your face as you talk about it. Now I have to immediately read <laughs> I, this one. I've, so I've, like, I've tried to me. write. So like that's one piece of fiction. I've tried to write a few pieces of fiction and create art. Certainly, my very favorite thing that I've been involved in is the movie Bitcoin is generational wealth. Yeah, that's right. And narrated, yeah. and which I would really uh, love it if you put a link to that in the show notes. And we will, YouTube. yes. So anyone just, you know, if you don't have the show notes, search Bitcoin is generational wealth. It's a 14 minute movie. It's really well produced. So watch it full screen, volume up, pay attention to it. It it tells the story of what, why we needed Bitcoin and what it might, uh, what gift it might be for humanity. And I was really, really proud Um and happy to be involved in that particular project. So I'll have all these independent links to write, right, you know, on this episode, but, and then yeah. uh, keep going. Did I cut you off or you're about to say something else? No, there, there really is. I mean, there, there's a lot there and you can find it. So my essays on medium are broken into there's the why Bitcoin series, which is which, so good. So, so good. I no, really, so it's, I've, it's I've, excellent. I've reordered and rewritten all of them. And so there's a better version of every single one of them in my Why Bitcoin book. And if you go to whybitcoinbook.com, you can buy an ebook version of it for five dollars, five US dollars. Please do that for your own sake. Like you're just you're gonna get yeah. a, a very just better wonder, version I, of I wanna suggest that everybody do that because your essays break down some of the concepts that are attacked when Bitcoin's attacked in the media, your essays beautifully deconstruct some of these things um in a, you know, in a three minute read. Right. Um That's so I really yeah, I really, and, and I, when I originally wrote these essays, I kind of wrote them in the, or not kind of, I published them in the order that they came to me in and I published them with like hyperlinks to each other. So the last paragraphs are kind of weak because they're, they're all designed to get you to link to another one. And so I, I went into this project last year. I'm just going to open up a copy of it here for you to turn them into a book. And there were 20, there were 26, ess there were 25 essays on medium there was one essay on swan which was the 26th and then there was a 27th essay that i wrote which ended up in the book it was published um again a, an inferior version of it was published on medium but not in the white bitcoin series and i turned them into a coffee table book oh um, wow and so this is um this is what i was selling for <laughs> satoshi's yeah so uh, you know and, and i was there and i didn't cross paths with you and it, um and basically every, every single story is just a two-page spread so each one has a headline on each new page and each one is kind of it's okay read. where do you get that version of your book i'll send you the link so it's a, it's at blurb.com slash user slash t strolig or tomer strolig okay because they, they cut they cut it off because um, they only have so many characters in their database so 
they're missing the HT at the end of my name, but I'll send you the link and um, you can get the hardcover version of it. There's two versions. There's a hardcover and a soft cover, so I'll just show. But they're both on photo paper. Like this one's on 140 pound pearl finished glossy paper and this one's on 100 pound glossy paper. So like a really fine magazine quality. Oh, and, got it. Um, the soft cover is uh, 25, $24.99 US. The hard cover is 49 USD. So it's not cheap, but it's the only it's the only coffee table Bitcoin book that there is. And you've got 27 essays um, inside of it. It's full color. It's, it's easy to read. It's not academic. And um, I'm really happy about this book. And um, the, the, there was a work of art that was created for the cover by a Bitcoin artist named uh, Chief Monkey. There's a little bit of a write-up in here about that. That was sold at auction at the Bitcoin conference uh, the, the past couple of weeks ago. So I'm really happy with this book. Why Bitcoin? Like I, I try, I've been trying to make beautiful things for Bitcoiners, like the movie and this book, and and other things in the future. I'm just trying to push everything um, to a higher level, so that uh, that's a beautiful looking uh, book. Yeah, the content I know is is excellent from reading it, but that the the format that you've put that book in, I'm actually yeah, I'd like to get the link because I want to put. I'd like it just for my for home too, but I'm going to put a copy at the front of our office too. And so when people sit down, just a nice book to have sitting, um, lying around there. So, uh, yeah, that's super. great. Well, I appreciate that. Um, really no, well, I appreciate you everything that you're doing and, and, and sharing and all the content that you put out. And I think it's our, you know, uh, our, our mutual friend, Marco kind of put us in touch and I thank mm -hmm. him for that. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, Marco. yeah, I'm just grateful. There's people Tomer, that you decided to have that walk in Toronto or wherever you were in the area and thought you're going to start writing. Um, you're, you're, you know, I'm we're all benefiting from that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can tell, which is too. great, which is great. And uh, you're benefiting a lot of people. And there's a lot of people that you're touching that you probably never hear from. So yeah. thank you from yeah, those of us you. out there That's that read kind. your content. Yeah, no, I know. Really, really appreciate it. And if there's anything we can ever do to, you know, further, I don't know, share your message, please always reach out. Um, I feel grateful to have the opportunity to uh, get your thoughts and ideas um, like this. So thanks for taking the time to do this. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you too. You have a great day. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.